All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I've got 10.01 on my clock. So welcome to the uh, Solutions Program uh, webinar. Uh, we're really excited to launch this brand new program as part of uh, SHRF's suite of programs, uh, along with our partners. Uh, I'm Karen Tilsley, Director of Programs and Partnerships. So today, um, I want to talk to you a bit about SHRF. Um, we have, we're on uh, some, taking some new strategic directions, which affect uh, a lot of the way we do things. So hopefully this will give you an update of where we're going. Um, talk about the program, including the dates, eligibility criteria, the funding, um, how the application process works, and there should be time at the end um, of the hour today for um, questions and answers, as I mentioned through the, the box, uh, the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, and then my plan is to follow up um, next week and send the slides out to all the attendees and also follow up with some frequently asked questions and um, just to send out generally to everybody and then obviously there'll be some individual back and forth with questions that people have as well. So um, Sheriff, we've been around since 2002. Um, we are undergoing that strategic refresh and, and focusing some new programs. Um, so this program, Solutions, is the first you'll see as part of this new strategic refresh. Um, but we still are Sheriff. Uh, we, we have the Sheriff Act um, that really outlines our mandate, and that is to fund, support, and promote the impact of health research that matters to Saskatchewan. So we are here to support uh, your work because we really believe that the health research that you do is vital to um, making people in Saskatchewan healthier. So that's, that's why we're here. And to enable that, um, we sure um, uh, offers our programs, our research funding programs. Um, we uphold a rigorous peer review process. We measure and share the impact of our funded research. And really importantly, we collaborate with partners who can help uh, maximize the impact of our work. Um, we have, as I mentioned, um, two funding partners on board with this program, but there is the option to work together with more partners on the virtual care focus area. And in the future, we really hope to grow the number of partners that we have. So if you're interested in um, uh, learning more about that, feel free to reach out at any time. So through our new strategic direction, um, we have these goals that you should see reflected through our program objectives. So we're really looking to strengthen research capacity and competitiveness, increase investment in research and innovation, and align research with stakeholder needs. And through everything that we do, um, we uphold our five values listed here, accountability, adaptability, collaboration, excellence, and integrity. So we really look for that in the research that we fund, the work that we do, and, and um, the partners that we work with. So um, yeah, that's, that's how we do things at Sheriff. I uh, put a little visual here, it sort of explains what we're trying to do with this solutions program. So um, as an introduction, the purpose of this program is to mobilize the research community and its partners to focus and coordinate their diverse skills and perspectives to address timely Saskatchewan health challenges. So this is the first time we're offering this program. Um, so we expect there'll be some questions, maybe some need for clarifications and feedback that will help us improve the program going forward. Um, but we're really excited about what we've come up with based on um, input from a lot of people. And so I'm a visual person. So what I'm just showing here is um, just some random graphs. Um, so on the left, you can imagine all of those dots um, being either research topics, or you can imagine if this graph was about one topic, that all those dots would be the different research groups, the different sectors, so the health system, maybe the more academic research groups, industry, all sort of working um, spread out and not in a coordinated fashion. So what we're trying to move toward in this program is that nice data plot on the right where everyone's work is coming together people are collaborating and moving towards um, making an impact in those important areas so the way we've envisioned this program is to offer a variety of funding opportunities um, to support uh, research in focus areas and partnered investments 
Um, so each year the funding opportunities um, may change depending on the focus area. So this year, as you probably know, there are two different funding opportunities within the program. So there's the innovation grant and the impact grant. And our vision for the future is to offer um, more, we're sort of starting in the middle of the pipeline, I guess, um, and we're hoping to have opportunities that um, stretch further along that pipeline, sort of um, before innovation, past impact, really looking at implementing those changes to make a difference um, for the health of Saskatchewan people. So um, yeah, lots of things depend on our ability to do that, but we decided to start with these two opportunities that lined up well with our focus areas for this year and um, kind of building on our previous program. So, so that's uh, how we've structured the, the program overall. And we're really excited for this first um, endeavor that the Alzheimer's Society Saskatchewan and the Lung Association Saskatchewan chapter have um, come on board as funding partners and identified focus areas that are important to their stakeholders. So we'll talk more about those focus areas as we go through here. So the two funding opportunities, um, they are separated by objectives, terms, and amounts. So the innovation grant is smaller at 50,000 with a shorter term of one year. And it's really about catalyzing those innovative new ideas, um, promoting creative problem solving, uh, maybe getting some of that early pilot data, that type of thing. Um, and it has to be uh, relating to one of the focus areas. And we're really looking to support transdisciplinary teams, including knowledge users. So the impact grant um, is longer at two years uh, with $150,000 available over that term. And so with this grant, the, we're really looking for the research to be moving into the translation into real world settings. So moving along that pipeline and um, implementing it in practical setting, practical applications. Um, so you hopefully can see that progression from innovation to impact and when you're preparing your application, you should really focus on where you fit best because um, you have to pick <laughs> and you shouldn't pick the impact just because it's more money. So the competition dates from beginning to end are laid out here. So we launched this about a month ago and then uh, this these dates take us all the way through to when the successful grants will start, which is March 1st next year. Um, so we have the eligibility window from for the month of October and the application deadline um, is November 26th at 4.30. We do have um, our system set to, to close down at that time and then funding decisions will come at the end of February um, so we're able to complete our peer review process um, late, late January, early February. Um, and be sure that you allow some time for your internal institutional deadlines and getting all the approvals you need um, from, from them and any letters of support, that kind of thing, all needs to be ready for the application deadline of November 26th. So the funding that we have available is divided into different envelopes based on the focus area as well as the funding opportunity. So this table summarizes the funding we have available. Um, it's a total of, um, oh, I'm going to mess this up. There's $700,000 from SHRF, um, $100,000 from Lung Association, and uh, $200,000 from, uh, sorry, $100,000 from, yeah, Lung Association, and $50,000 from the Alzheimer's Society. So um, the innovation grants, those $50,000 one year grants, um, we have five in the area of virtual care available, um, four in the area of lung health, and two in the area of dementia. And then the virtual care area, we have three impact grants available. So funding will be allocated according to each of these envelopes. So you have to select both the focus area and the funding opportunity that you're applying to. So we'll go through the focus areas next. Um, the virtual care focus area, it's really important that you read through the program guide um, for the full description, but just to highlight, we're looking to create that collective impact, moving those dots together, as I talked about earlier, um, 
to connect patients to the care they need when and where they need it and improve quality and coordination of care. So um, the research that we fund really, we're looking for it to add to the knowledge base, develop evidence related to virtual care delivery and implementation. So it's not, virtual care isn't a sort of add on um, to your project. It really needs to be a core component and um, you know, your, some of the outcomes you're looking at need to relate to virtual care to be eligible. The lung health focus area, uh, the Lung Association of Saskatchewan has identified um, three different areas that are important um, for this call. And um, again, take a look at the guide for the full description, but I'll just highlight that um, the three are how to better serve Indigenous peoples of Saskatchewan regarding their lung health, um, the impact of canvas use on lung health, and patient and caregiver education for the self-management of lung disease. So, have a read about the full description and uh, think about whether you would be addressing one of those areas. Um, again, dementia, have a read at the full description, um, but the Alzheimer's Society Saskatchewan is looking at supporting research to enable a timely diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, as well as informing and promoting adoption of interventions to reduce risk and prevent disease. So those focus areas that I just mentioned, um, for your application to be eligible, it must fit at least one of those focus areas. Um, and you must select the funding opportunity, innovation or impact. Um, we must meet the minimum uh, team requirements, which I will go into. And principal applicants are permitted just one application to the solution program per competition year, regardless of focus area or funding opportunity. That does not exclude the principal applicant from being a co-principal applicant or a co-applicant on other applications. Um, it's really just about that principal applicant role. So really, you can only have one application open as part of the solutions program as the PI. Um, and you're required to submit the information for, for eligibility um, by the cutoff date. Um, we can go back and forth until that cutoff date, which is October 31st. Um, and once you um, proceed into your full application, you can add more team members. You still need to meet eligibility. You know, you can change your title. You can, you know, make those kind of changes. So the message I think I have it at least three times throughout this presentation is um, to submit early. You don't even have to wait for um, the October 1st date. You can email me anytime to talk about your research and um, see if it might fit. Um, the final decision will be made based on the information you submit um, on through the online application eligibility step and uh, the final decision will be made there but it's always good to start the conversation early. So I mentioned the um, minimum team requirements so um, to start actually I'd like to um, lay out this framework we have um, after a lot of different <laughs> variations and trying to make things as clear as possible, we've settled on this um, role description where the research team is split into three buckets, so to speak. So we have the applicants or investigators, we mean the same thing when they say either one. Um, personnel, so uh, those are people that um, are being paid out of the grant, either as staff or trainees. And then supporters, which we used to call collaborators, but um, people found confusing because collaborators in collaboration have such a broad meeting. So we've changed that to supporters. So that could be um, individuals or organizations from a variety of sectors, um, could be from academics, community decision makers, industry, um, et cetera. So anyone that's providing a service or supporting the grant and its um, potential impacts in the future. So those, just going back up to the top, those applicant investigator roles. Um, the, you can be either the principal applicant, co-principal applicant or co-applicant depending on your involvement in the, the team. Um, and within there, an individual be, could be playing the role of a researcher, knowledge user or person with lived experience. Um, researcher I think is fairly self-explanatory, really it's somebody that has a job that 
requires them and pays them to do research and they have the training to do that. A knowledge user um, is really broad. It could be from any of those sectors we talked about in the supportive section, um, anyone that would be interested in the results of the research. And then a person with lived experience is of course likely interested in the results of the research as well, but brings a bit of a different um, perspective. And um, you know, in patient-oriented research, they might say patient partners, but um, it, we use person uh, with lived experience to just really broadly encompass um, what that, you know, the variety of um, people that might be involved with that perspective. So at a bare minimum, your team needs to have two Saskatchewan-based researchers as applicants and one Saskatchewan-based knowledge user applicants. And that's just the bare minimum because we're talking about collaborative research that's bringing people together, that's relevant to Saskatchewan um, knowledge users. So you can see that's really the bare minimum um, and check the focus areas for any additional requirements that are specific to, to that. So you have to meet that bare eligibility minimum at the eligibility check as well as a full application. Um, but a minimum, you know, the minimum doesn't mean excellent is kind of the note I left for myself here. Um, we're really looking for a collaborative team with disciplines and perspective to support the proposed research and the potential impacts. One thing to keep in mind is that the principal applicant um, needs to have affiliation where they can hold the funding at one of the institutions that has an MOU with SHRF and those are shown on the slide here. So if you have any questions about that, you can be in touch with me or your research office. And other things to consider about your research project team, um, the expertise needed to do what you proposed, um, that's obviously gonna be judged by the peer reviewers. Um, and some other things in terms of the, the impact that come up um, in the peer review criteria and that you're asked to speak to in the application that you could, sh could should consider for your team is um, what you're able to do in terms of building capacity and mentoring trainees and early career researchers. So that's one way your, your grant can have impact. It may not be feasible for every project, um, but really think about how you can highlight that. Um, and including people with lived experience and knowledge users to ensure research is relevant and usable. Um, so don't just meet the one, you know, don't have a token person on there just for the sake of it so you can pass eligibility. That's really not going to um, get you very far. It doesn't capture the purpose of the grant. It, it doesn't meet the review criteria. Um, yeah, so keep that in mind. Um, so consider those supporters that can speak to feasibility and potential for impact. Um, so they'd be, those are people that provide a letter of support. They're not on the team. And you can also, we keep talking about Saskatchewan and the you know, minimum requirements for Saskatchewan involvement, but having nat national and international participation is great. Um, we have the funding from um, Sheriff and our partners has to be spent in Saskatchewan, but that doesn't mean there's um, not an opportunity and for impact nationally and internationally, which is wonderful as well and building those collaborations. So those are excellent things as well. So when you're thinking about your budget, um, there's a few things to uh, keep in mind um, related to allowable expenses. I mean, just the basic principle, you only ask for what you need. You have to justify it um, based on what you've proposed. Um, so if you can get it from, from somewhere else, um, you know, borrow, ask for in kind, anything you can do, um, you should do. And then just ask, um, just ask the budget um, for this program for those direct costs that you can't get elsewhere. So you have the opportunity to fill out the request to SHRF, which includes the funding partners, as well as another table to show other contributions. So this could be cash or in-kind resources that are available to you to um, complete what you've proposed. And we've updated our budget template. Um, if you've applied before, you'll see that. Um, so we've um, broken it out into three high-level categories with, that have some subcategories. I'm 
not going into in this presentation, but we're looking at the personnel um, costs, breaking out trainees and staff, uh, research costs, um, and to know this program does not allow for equipment. Um, and if you, you know, if you have any questions about that or have like a really minor exception, um, we can sort that out before uh, the application is due. And knowledge sharing cost is broken out in the budget. And we want you to show us the academic, uh, knowledge sharing with an academic audience. So your traditional open access publication fees, um, attending academic conferences, that can be no more than 10% of your budget. And the non-academic, we want you to break that out. And here we're saying you should have something here. Um, so we don't actually have a maximum here, um, but, but we want to be sure that you have some plans to share the knowledge outside the, the academic community. So one way that um, through expenses that we're trying to support that collaboration across sectors, um, two things I wanted to highlight. If you're working with an industry partner, um, we've made the decision that um, anyone from industry should choose the supporter role in the application, which means they provide a letter of support and, um, and yeah, so they're not a, a team member per se, um, but they do get to speak to their involvement. And if there is part of the budget request to SHRF that um, is for reimbursement of goods and services to that industry partner, then we expect that industry partner to provide cash or in-kind contributions equal or greater to 50% of that. So you would show that in your in-kind contributions, um, cash and in-kind contributions in that second budget table. So we'd be looking for that. And then if you're working with um, not-for-profit community partners, um, this could be um, either an applicant or supporter role. Um, that the knowledge user release time is permitted, um, but the activities must be directly related to the proposed research activities, and you would need an employer letter of support. And I really encourage you, in either of these cases actually, to reach out to me and just talk about it so that, um, you know, we don't run into any confusion when the application is being peer reviewed about eligible expenses and raising any concerns at that later date best to um, sorted out early on. So um, some, some news, I'm not sure how far this news has gotten, but we're developing a new RMS. So that's our research management system. That's where you do applications, where peer review happens, where you fill out reports. Um, so the, the current version you see was developed back in 2013. And Technology's come a long way, so we really needed a modernized platform. Um, there was a lot of opportunities to improve um, data capture uh, through the, the, the new platforms and really to incorporate feedback we've received over the years and improve usability. So we've tried to do as much as we can, but we kind of hit the end of the road with our current system. So um, the programs team and everyone here at Sheriff is um, hard at work in uh, testing and developing that new system as we speak. Um, and because we're transitioning, importing data from our old system into our new system, we actually need some downtime. So watch our newsletter for more information and sign up um, at sheriff.ca if you aren't already to receive our newsletter. Um, so, so the system's actually gonna not be available um, starting mid-September. And then October 1st, only the solutions program um, will be open. So first the eligibility and then the application once you go through. So, um, so you won't be able to see other applications or reports that you've done on the system. So if you want to um, grab anything, I mean, we, we will have access here. So you could always contact us, but it'd be a good idea to do that um, before um, just in the next couple of weeks here. And yeah, we, we think that all our improvements and changes should make things easier, but we're obviously always here to support you in using the new system. So that um, eligibility step, um, just a few more details about what we're doing there. So it's really, it's an internal administrative step where we're looking for the relevance to the funding opportunity, purpose and objectives. 
Um, we're ensuring the principal applicant is eligible. Um, it really helps us create that review committee to ensure we have um, the expertise that we need. Um, informing the partners and um, of the interest in their, their focus areas and confirming uh, the fit and relevance uh, with their focus areas. And really to formalize the eligibility process. So if any sort of exceptions come up or anything that the reviewers might have questioned during the review process, we would just want to, you know, any sheriff decisions we can record for the reviewers to see so that they're not um, left wondering, um, you know, why, why this or that was allowed. Um, just reading a question we had, I think I'll, I'll come to that question, Mira, at the end. Um, yeah, so the eligibility, so as I mentioned, it's reviewed internally at SHRF. Um, and what we're looking at is the summary of proposed research you'll provide online. Um, you'll have to get your team members to make sure that they have a profile in the RMS and update. Our new profile is more involved so that we can really um, capture a lot of great information about our applicants and our reviewers. So everyone will be updating their profiles and they'll have to accept the invitation to be on the application so that we know that you can meet those minimum team requirements. And then you also have an opportunity at eligibility to take, uh, to mention suggested or excluded reviewers. And this just really helps us not necessarily get those people exactly, but even to get a sense of the type of people that would be appropriate for reviewing your application. Um, and yeah, so we may contact them, we may not, um, but it is extremely helpful for you to suggest people who are not in conflict who would have uh, expertise to review your application. So I've sort of touched on this a few times. So the, the system will open October 1st where you enter the eligibility information. And then October 31st is the cutoff to complete that information. But don't wait, you can contact me anytime over email to talk about your idea. Um, and if you wait till October 31st, you submit something through the RMS, I've never heard from you. I kind of take a look at it and it's totally, you know, kind of out to lunch or whatever, then we're kind of stuck because the, the cutoff has already happened. But um, if we've had some conversations earlier, then we have time to go back and forth and for me to talk to the to Lung Association and Alzheimer's Society and make sure that um, everyone's on the right track. So uh, once you get through eligibility, you'll be working on the full proposal. Um, and the innovation grant um, has a shorter research proposal of six pages. The impact grant has eight pages. And um, Otherwise, the, the application forms are very similar. Um, we do have a sex, section on sex and gender. Um, we allow you to upload a timeline, um, references, those budget tables I mentioned, um, and then you, to support the numbers in the budget, you, can, you upload a two-page maximum justification. Um, a really great thing we think um, as part of the, the new platform is what um, I don't know if this is the name that will stick, but we're calling them contribution forms right now. And so anyone that's involved, so that includes applicants, personnel, and supporters, will be added by the um, principal investigator or invited to the application. And depending on which role they are, so applicant, personnel, supporter, and then whether they're a researcher, knowledge user, um, they or personnel, they complete different information. So. If you're a researcher applicant, then we'll need your common CV. And then you'll also talk about um, the role you play on the form. So you'll have a, a spot to do that. And then um, if you're personnel, you wouldn't provide CV. You would just talk about your contribution to the project. Supporters would upload a letter of support. Um, yeah, so this is a, a way to capture everything together to show uh, the different roles and what people are bringing to the team and what they will do on the project. And then uh, the, this has been consistent for, for years now. We, it's a really important part of what we um, support and what we track over time is the impact description. I'll talk a bit about that next slide. And then you'll need to get that research office uh, signature on the full application. 
we don't need it at eligibility. So just keep that in mind for the full application. And that's the November 26th deadline. So the impact categories I was just mentioning, so there's a better definition um, uh, on the application, but uh, there's four categories. Sometimes it's split into five just by moving economic impacts down, but it's the same thing. Uh, so capacity building, I mentioned, um, for, for us, that's a lot about people. It could be infrastructure, but that's not really what we're funding uh, through this program. So the, you know, building capacity, that could be in the community. So community uh, capacity for, for doing research. It could be uh, trainees, um, that type of thing. Advancing knowledge is really about adding to our collective knowledge. Um, it could be through, um, this is generally the more academic output. Uh, informing decision making, um, this is, could include some of your, should include some of your uh, knowledge sharing outside the academic community. And then also you'd be talking about some potential um, uh, future impact on informing decision making. So these, the later ones here, we're probably getting more into future potential, um, but thinking about the potential for health, social and economic uh, impacts. Um, so those those tend to be the more really high level, um, you know, why you're doing this, but probably not affected directly by what you're doing in this project, but you should still talk about where um, this line of research could have those impacts in the future. So the peer review process is um, according to our peer review guidelines. Um, and we are looking for a minimum score of 3.5 out of 5 um, on all three criteria that I'll talk about on the next slide. So the reviewers looking at the applications will be multidisciplinary um, from across Canada, but outside Saskatchewan to avoid that conflicts of interest. Um, there'll be two lead reviewers um, on the committee assigned to each application. And we get external reviewers to provide advice uh, to the committee as needed. And there'll be a live virtual discussion. Um, we've actually have a lot of experience doing virtual live peer review meetings. Um, so it's, you know, interesting to see the, the trend um, everywhere right now. We're, we're actually able to provide uh, advice to other funders because we are experienced in this. So um, yeah, I'm confident that will go forward well. And uh, the, then the funding is applicated top down in each funding envelope that I mentioned earlier in that table. So the review criteria, um, there's three sections that reviewers will look at and they are weighted um, according to the percentages you see there. So I've just put a really brief look at the criteria, but they're fully spelled out in the program guide. Um, so we've got the relevance and needs. So what, you know, how does this address the focus area? How does it respond to Saskatchewan context? Um, scientific rationale is obviously really important. And do you have those people, the knowledge user, people with lived experiences, supporters to really ensure that your research is relevant and usable? So the quality of proposal is 50% 50, 50 and the approach or methods is a really key part of that, as well as the team expertise for both researcher, knowledge user, um, supporters. And then, you know, the feasibility of the work plan, the budget resources, and overall readability. So those all um, go together to um, uh, evaluate the quality of proposal and then the potential for impact at 25%. So is this, is there a potential for, um, is the impact proposed significant? Um, does it help to move this research forward? So really thinking about that pipeline concept that we're using with this program. Um, the knowledge sharing plans will really support that. And then the, the potential for impact. And then those CAS, Canadian uh, Academy for Health Sciences impact categories that I talked about, um, really based on what you've described there and the, importance of those. 
So I've just got a couple more slides here and then we'll have, uh, I've got a couple of questions in the, the chat here oh, and, and the question box. So um, we'll, we'll come to those uh, just uh, two slides here. Um, so the, um, just some general tips, um, these really are applicable to all of our programs, but read the application package or program guide. Um, we put a lot of information in there. We put a lot of thought into it and really anything that comes up um, that application package and program guide become the, the reference point to ensure we're um, answering questions uh, consistently and applying the policy consistently. Um, so just to try to imagine yourself being a reviewer and would you be interested in reading your proposal? That sounds kind of petty, I guess, but you really want to grab the reviewer's interest and get them excited about your application. Um, making your case is all, all part of that, so don't just assume that the um, reviewers just you know, automatically know that whatever you're doing is important. You should explain why it's important. Detail the how, so reviewers really want to understand, um, you know, you need those details like power calculations if that's relevant to your methods, um, how you're going to recruit, how you're going to overcome, you know, those potential obstacles um, to recruitment, for example. They want to know that if they are recommending that um, we invest in this research that the applicants have really thought through the important parts and that they'll get good information, that we'll get good um, information based on the analysis plans and things like that. So make it easy to read. Um, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't want to read like eight pages of text margin to margin with no space. Um, so you don't want a grumpy reviewer, <laughs> make them happy. Uh, make it easy to read. And um, formatting really helps to support that and also um, there's formatting guidelines in the, the program guide that you need to follow. Uh, check your math. Um, I think the Excel templates we provide should be really helpful but just double check that there's no, you know, especially when you're comparing your budget table to your budget justification. Um, if those, you know, if you made a change to your budget table but forgot to update it in your justification then you know the reviewer is looking at it and one their confidence is um you know maybe negatively affected but also they're just you know it, it's confusing it it's, doesn't instill that confidence field test your application get other people to read it um and then go back to the application package and make sure that you didn't miss anything So next steps I mentioned, um, I will send a copy of this presentation to attendees, um, but I'm going to wait till next week so that um, we can add kind of a frequently asked questions and any clarifications, you know, based on the questions we get today, we might uh, realize that we need to clarify a few things. Um, this is the first time the program's being offered. And this is maybe the fifth time I've said it to contact me early about the fit with the program and focus areas. Um, you don't have to wait till October 1st to do that. And yeah, we have the remaining time here uh, for questions. So I'll just leave up my email on the slide here as well as um, so the people you're likely talking to are myself, Karen Tilsley, uh, Tanya Skorbohatch is our programs coordinator. And then you've probably also been in touch maybe in the past with uh, Danny Robertson Borsma. Um, so she'll be supporting us on this as well. Okay, um, just try to go back to um, a question from Mira. For the impact, can it be an innovative idea which will have impact, but it needs, um, needs to intensive area? Not, yeah, sorry, not totally sure what you mean there, but in the first part of it, yeah, if you're applying for the innovation funding opportunity, um, you're, there's a little more of that potential for impact as opposed to promise for impact. So the reviewers would expect that. Um, that's why we're talking about creative problem solving, um, new ideas, that type of thing. So we still want you to think about the potential for impact, but we realize that it's less of a guarantee and that's that's okay. We want to um, support um, 
pushing those, those boundaries as opposed to just incremental advances. Um, for sex and gender and impact, um, so just asking about how many words pages do you have to complete for sex and gender and impact sections. Um, Danny, would you mind uh, messaging me about the sex and gender one, the impact? We allow 100 words for um, each of the four impact categories. So um, it's not like pages and pages upload. It's a, a brief description in a field, um, really highlighting the areas that you expect to have impact um, through what you proposed and, and thinking about the future as well. Um, Okay, so Danny just messaged me back. Um, so there's two check boxes and then 300 words to explain how or how not. Um, so the sex and gender question, that's, that's what um, you have the two check boxes and 300 words. And then someone else also asked, can you explain the sex and gender question? Why would it be important for the application? Um, it may not be for every application, but there's a huge push, um, especially you know, in Canada, across, across the country, um, just really about understanding um, sex and gender variables and um, so we're asking whether you are including that as part of your analysis and if not why um, so it may not be relevant for everyone but we really encourage you to address that um, and if you haven't heard of it I know there's some resources at the institutions about sex and gender your research office might be a good place to talk to and also CIHR has um, a sex and gender training module online that's free. So um, I, yeah, note to self, I'll include that in the frequently asked questions that we follow up with so people can um, get a lot more of the background on the sex and gender. Um, okay, to clarify, the new RMS system will open October 1st. So it's October 1st to 31st that the team members will have to create a profile and be invited to the application prior to eligibility cutoff. Correct. So we, we are importing contacts, um, but the profile is different on the new system. So I would I leave time for everybody um, at least to meet minimum eligibility criteria, leave some time to either register a new profile if they weren't in the old system or update their old profile on the new system um, before the, the 31st. And if you have any troubles, Tanya will 100% help you get through that. So don't, don't struggle along. Um, if you're having issues, just uh, let me or Tanya know. Um, yeah, but that is correct. Um, team members will have to have that profile be invited and accept actually. So they get an email and then click to accept. And so they show up on the application. Okay, can a knowledge user submit a CCV? Do they have that option within the system? Yeah, it'll be um, either one. So they, yeah. Sorry, we've been doing so much development. I can't remember exactly how we are framing it, but knowledge users aren't required to do the Canadian Common CV, but if that's what they wish to do, then they certainly could. Um, but if, uh, but it's much more open for a knowledge user in terms of what they um, provide to let the reviewers know about their um, experience and expertise. I assume that patient or family partners do not need to submit a CCV, even though they would be a co-I. Correct. So um, there's, it's like a dynamic, um, once, so you'd add, that person would make a profile and then you would invite them and they would accept and they would accept in the role of co-investigator. And then that would trigger a contribution form. And on that form, they would select whether they are a, um, person with lived experience, so a patient family partner, I think, would fit under there, and or a knowledge user or a researcher, and then based on that, they would be asked to complete um, different information, and we wouldn't be asking for a CV um, or requiring that from people with lived experience. Can you, uh, oh, what did I do? Okay, here we go. 
found my place again. Can you elaborate on knowledge user, give an example, doctors, community members, et cetera? Um, yes, yes, yes. Basically, a knowledge user has a really broad definition. Um, anyone that would sometimes are called research knowledge users or end users. So people that can use the information that is um, gained from this research or this line of research. So, you know, it's not always immediate from one project, but um, the, the overall um, interest in that um, that information. So they help provide, knowledge users help provide context, um, relevance, um, really ensuring that the, the research can be usable and really helping move it into um, those real world settings because they have those connections to how the research can be used. So um, yeah, the, I know CHR has a definition that lists about 10 different things, but it you know, even that is not um, totally um, inclusive. There could be other examples. So, yep, doctors, community members. Basically, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, somebody who has a um, research intensive position at a research institution is not a knowledge user, but there's lots of examples of, of people that would be. So, if you have, you know, specific questions as you're going along, feel free, you know, when you're trying to work on that eligibility, um, don't be afraid to just check in with us. Um, as a nonprofit app organization, can the executive director be considered as a principal applicant? Um, no, so the, let me just go back. Um, here we go. So these institutions we have an MOU with, so they really agree to take on a lot of responsibility in terms of managing our grant funds, um, monitoring ethics and things like that. So the principal applicant has to have an affiliation where they can hold the funding at one of these institutions. So um, the executive director of like, you know, a, a like community charity, not-for-profit, that kind of thing, um, could be a co-principal applicant um, which indicates an equal level of leadership um, on the project, but they're not the person that's managing the funds. Um, but certainly as part of the budget, there could be uh, funding that goes to support um, research activities that are happening through that nonprofit organization. Okay, I've got a couple more here. Um, yeah, so this is asking again about the CV for knowledge users and people with lived experiences. Um, I'm gonna ask you, Danny, to help me out again <laughs> what we agreed on for this. Um, I can't recall, I, I think we, we do have some templates, but there's perhaps some more flexibility there. Um, the CCV is only for people who have um, research positions or who wish to use the CCV template. Uh, this question about the virtual care objective. Um, could it be a solution or technology provided to minimize patients' visits to the hospital slash doctor? Um, yeah, that, I mean, at first glance, um, so technology solutions are, is listed in the focus area. So yeah, maybe have a read through that again. And, and you know, as we get into these individual project questions, um, it, it is helpful to have a more fulsome uh, discussion, but based on um, this sort of brief comment, it, it sounds like um, we're on the right track there. And uh, Danny wasn't paying attention, I guess, when I asked her, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, the, CCV for, sorry, the CV for knowledge users and people with lived experiences, do we have a set template for each of those or is it more flexible? I know, sorry, I do know the people with lived experiences is a testimonial, um, basically up to 250 words where they talk about um, how they, um, why they're interested in being part of this project and kind of leaves, you know, it open to how much they are comfortable sharing. Um, but uh, what I can't recall, Danny, is what if we have the set knowledge user template or if it's more open.
Okay, so we do have a template for knowledge users that, um, yeah, well, I'll put that in the frequently asked questions when I follow up from this presentation. We'll link to all those templates so that you can um, see what's on there. Um, yeah, and then lived experience will have that statement test testimonial. So yeah, we'll include that in the frequently asked um, questions so you and links to those templates. Um, as the RMS is being updated, will there be any changes for uploading Sheriff CVs for PI, co-applicants, and others? Um, I think I talked about a few changes. So researchers still have the common CV. Um, we're not connected directly to the common CV, like there's no data transfer happening. So you do have to validate your CV on the common CV website download the PDF and upload it to the system. That's really the most streamlined way to do that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, I'll send those links um, for the templates for knowledge users and people with lived experience. And so whether they're a co-applicant um, is less important than whether they're a researcher, knowledge user, or person with lived experience. Um, so some people have found that um, people have been reluctant to write testimonials. Um, can they provide an audio file? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I will look into what that would look like in terms of the application. Um, so the question is really, could people provide an audio file instead of a written testimonial? Um, yeah, and people are really only required to share what they um, feel comfortable with and then and then anything else would be how they're involved in the project so um, I'll look into that and get back um, as part of those frequently asked questions um, whether that's possible or not um, but yeah we like to be flexible and uh, see how we can make this work uh, if you receive innovation funding this year, is there an opportunity to continue advancing the same project by applying for impact funding next year? Wonderful question. That is our goal. So we, of course, haven't launched the program for next year. We don't know our budget for next year, but that is the intent, is to move um, uh, for the virtual care focus area to move projects from those innovation grants to the impact grant. So if you've wrapped up the one-year funding um, then you would be ready in time to apply for a um, impact grant in the next funding opportunity. So I can't speak too much, like I said, about budget and um, what we'll have available, but that is definitely the intent, is to move projects through that pipeline. And in terms of the, the partner focus areas, working with Lung Association, Alzheimer's Society, and any other partners that might come on board, um, that will be, I know so far partners are really on board with that idea of progressing projects as well. So we'll work closely with them to look at, um, you know, supporting focus areas from the previous year moving into along the pipeline over to the impact grant. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions I'm seeing in my question and answer box here. I feel like I've been listening to my own voice for a while here. It's kind of strange. Um, yeah, I just, I'll just keep talking for a few minutes in case anyone's typing away. Um, yeah, we're, we're here if you have questions. Um, we'll try to follow up to everybody. Um, update anything we need to based on what we've heard from you today and yeah we we hope that the new rms is better than the old one uh we we're sure it will be and we're you know that you know just having a new look and feel can be um sometimes daunting but we think it'll be quite intuitive and like i said we're here to support you um yeah, I'll just thank our, our funding partners, Lung Association, Alzheimer's Society. Um, really, you know, really wonderful to be able to work together, pool our resources, and really address those areas that are important to Saskatchewan. If you know any 
funders that are you think might be interested in this program um, have them reach out to, to me or anyone at SHRF. Not seeing any new questions, so I think I'll wrap it up. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that we are recording, um, but I don't think <laughs> um, that should be a problem because uh, I was the only one that could talk this whole time. So, so we did record this session and yeah. Uh, oh, okay, got a couple more, well, just one more here. Can a student of the university be a principal applicant? Um, so that would be a no. Um, if you talk to your research office, they would tell you that um, they would not be eligible to hold the grant. Um, and so that's, yeah. So basically a trainees can't be the principal applicant. They, um, if they're getting paid from the grant and, or it's part of their training, then they would be in the personnel role. If they are already an expert, in what you're doing and they're not getting paid from the grant then they could potentially be a team member um, so yeah if you want to clarify just follow up okay well thanks again everyone for joining and we'll follow up next week with the slides and some um, q a okay have a great day everyone <laughs>